Welcome back to Basic English Grammar with Mary's Balls. This is Module 3, and we will be mo moving into some new grammar topics. In Module 2, as you recall, we went over nouns, and we said they were names of things, and that nouns could be persons, places, things, or ideas, and that we always found nouns as subjects, direct objects, or as objects of the prepositions inside of sentences. We also went over pronouns, and we said that some pronouns are used as subjects. Those in this column that we see here are always used as subjects of a sentence, whereas other pronoun forms are used only as direct objects or objects of the preposition. That would be these prone pronouns that we see here. In module three, we're going to move on to verbs, a little bit more detail about how verbs work in a sentence. Now, verbs show action, like run, jump, kick, hit, or fight. They're also used in three forms, and we're going to call these to make it easy on everybody, Form 1, Form 2, and Form 3. Let's look at the word play, for example. Form 1 of play is going to be just the word play, but in Form 2 and 3, as it is used, we're going to add an ED on the end, played. The same thing with move. In Form 1, it's just simply the word move, but in Forms 2 and 3, we're going to add ED, making it moved. And as we go down here, we see the same is true with talk, the same is true with dance, the same is true with learn. These are all what we call regular verbs <clears throat> in that Forms 2 and 3, we just simply add an ED on the end. However, some verbs in English are irregular. Their forms one, uh, excuse me, forms two and three are quite different. Let's look at these. Speak, for example. In form two, it becomes spoke. In form three, it becomes spoken. Write becomes wrote and written. Eat becomes ate and eaten. And so on and so forth. These are all irregular uh, verbs, but they're used very commonly. So, uh, being native speakers, you'll know that you automatically are uh, learn these as a child, and they become part of your vocabulary. When we use verbs, we use them mainly to show action in the present time, or the past time, or the future time. And we have verb forms to show all three. These forms of the verb that show time are called tenses, and there are six, six verb tenses. We're going to take a look at them right now, and then we're going to go into detail about how each of the tenses works. There's a present tense, a specific past tense, a vague past tense, a double past tense, a single future tense, and a double future tense. And in our next uh, page that we look at, we're going to start going into each of these, and you will see how the three forms of the verbs are used. The first tense we're going to look at is the present tense, things happening in the, at the present time. shows action in the present. For this, we use the form one of the verb. We're going to be using the verb to eat because it's simply an easy uh, you, a verb to use as an example, to eat. So we can say, Mary eats pizza. This is a present tense uh, form of the verb, and it means Mary sometimes eats pizza. 
We could also say, Mary eats pizza every Saturday. And this time, this in this case, we're talking about a, uh, an action that's done on a regular basis, regularly. And finally, Mary is eating pizza. That means she's eating it right now. All of these forms, going back, Mary eats pizza sometimes, Mary eats pizza every Saturday, and Mary is eating pizza now. All of these fall under the present tense. And you can see that the verb to eat is used simply in that way, eat, not ate, not ate nor eaten. Our next tense is called the specific past tense. In this case, we're talking about an action that happened in the past, but at a particular specific time. Let's take a look. By the way, we will be using form two of the verb to eat, and that form is ate. Bob ate pizza last Friday night. It shows that it happened one time, it was in the past, at a very specific time. The next verb tense we're going to call the vague past tense. In this case, we're talking about an action in the past, but the time that it happened is not important. And we will be using form three of the verb. In the case of to eat, that form would be eaten. Mary has eaten pizza before. The whole idea is sometime before she has eaten pizza. It doesn't matter when. The time can be vague. Here's another example using a plural subject. They have eaten pizza before. Again, sometime in the past. Time is not specific. Our next tense is called the double past. Now in this case, we have two actions in the past and we want to show that one action happened before the other one. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we're going to use form three of the verb, which as you recall is eaten. Before Mary played golf, she had eaten some pizza. Now you notice there are two actions going on here. Mary played golf and Mary ate some pizza. Which happened first? Well, the way you can tell is by this helping verb had right here. Had is next to this form of the verb, so the pizza action happened first and playing golf happened afterwards. Again, this is the double past showing that two actions happened in the past. One happened clearly before the other. Let's look at another example. After Mary had eaten some pizza, she played golf. You notice it's the same topic that we just mentioned in the previous example, but now instead of using before, we're using the word after. Still, let's read through. After Mary had eaten some pizza, she played golf. Which of these happened first? Did she eat pizza or did she play golf first? Well, you go to this helping word verb had, and wherever that is close to uh, the action, that, t that tells you what happened first. So in this case, Mary ate the pizza, and then she played golf. And this one sentence tells you both actions and which action happened first. The next tense is called the single future tense. This just means one action will happen in the future. We're going to use form one of the verb, in this case, eat. Mary will eat pizza next Saturday. Very clear, the action happens in the future. It is one action, and it tells when the action is going to happen. In this case, it's not important that the time be there. You could say, Mary will eat pizza. Again, in the future is all we need to know in this case, a single future action. The next tense is the double future. As you might guess, this means two actions are going to happen in the future, but we need to tell which action happens first 
in the sentence. Let's take a look. We will use form three of the verb eaten. By Friday, Mary will have eaten three pizzas. Notice we have two actions happening in the future. Friday will come and eating three pizza will come. Which of these will happen first? Well, we have to look at this helping verb, have eaten. That tells us that the pizza happened first and, and Friday happens afterwards. Let's look at another example that's a little bit different because we don't have the word, the verb eat here. We're going to use the word graduate. By July, Mary will have graduated college. Notice there's two actions happening in the future. July is going to come and graduating from college is going to come. Which of these is going to happen first? We look at the helping verb have. It's closest to graduated college. So Mary's going to graduate college and then July will come. Two actions in the future and it's very clear which action happens first. So those were the five, the, excuse me, the six uh, verb tenses. We are now going to move on to a different form of the verb as we've, most of the time that we've been talking about verbs, we've been talking about them as showing action. But there's one verb in particular that does not show action, but we use all the time, and that is the verb to be. All right. And this has forms that you will recognize right away. Am, is, was, are, were, and will be. You notice these don't, do not show any action, but they are important because they show a connection of something happening in the sentence. And later we're going to see that these can also be helping verbs to the more action-oriented verbs. Let's take a look at some examples here. I am a good student. Now this is no action going on here, simply a statement of fact. Mary is the captain of the volleyball team. Is is a form of the verb to be. Joe was the best baseball player. They are fine tennis players. And the girls were in the park. Whoops, sorry about that, girls. And we will be strong players next year. So all of these verbs, as you can see, do, do not show action, but show that something is happening. There's a connection between girls and park, between they and players, between Joe and baseball player, and so on. All right. Again, all of these are forms of the verb to be. Forms of the verb to be can also be used as what we call helping verbs. Let's take a look at how that works. I am writing a letter. Writing obviously shows action, but it needs to have a verb with it to help it with its action. Am, in this case, is a verb form of the verb to be, but it is uh, a helping verb. It's simply helping this verb writing. He is running around the track. Same thing. He is, is a helping verb of running. She was reading a book. Was is the helping verb. We are swimming in the pool. Are is the helping verb. And they were playing on the field. Were, again, a helping verb. Whoops, there's one more. We will be eating at Fred's restaurant. So here's a future form. We'll be eating. We have two helping verbs. We'll be helping the verb eating. Many verbs end in, are action verbs ending in ing. We just looked at a couple of them. Eating, swimming, going, playing. They all end in ing. And when verbs end in ing, we can do very interesting things with them. Let's take a look at what I mean. Here's a sentence. Mary was cooking hamburgers yesterday. Mary is the subject. 
was cooking. We have a double verb here. Hamburgers, direct object, yesterday, adverb, telling when the cooking took place, adverb. Now the important thing here is that we're using cooking as a verb. Clearly, this is an action that Mary is doing. All right. But look at this. Cooking is Mary's favorite hobby. What is the verb of this sentence? The verb is is. Cooking has now become a noun. We are using the word cooking, which previously we used as a verb. We are now using it as a noun, and it is the subject of the sentence. Cooking is, a, is an action, but it is, in this case, it is doing uh, something in the sentence, and it has become a subject. Cooking is Mary's favorite hobby. Okay. <clears throat> hobby, you might think this is the direct object, but guess what? It's the subject equivalent of cooking. Cooking and hobby are kind of the same thing. So we don't have a direct object here. Mary's and favorite are both adjectives describing hobby. Again, we are using cooking as a noun with its function in the sentence as a subject. Let's look at this sentence. Mary enjoys cooking. Hmm. Where's the subject? Mary. What's the verb? Enjoys. What is cooking? It is a direct object. Again, as in the second sentence up here, we're using cooking as a noun, and in this case, we can uh, declare it as a direct object of the verb enjoys. So simply because you have a verb with an ing on it doesn't always mean it's used as a verb. It's sometimes used as a noun. And as a noun, it can be used as a subject, it can be used as a direct object, and it even can be used as the object of the preposition, but we don't see that here. Let's look at another example, this time about Fred, who is one of Mary's friends. Fred is hunting for rabbits this morning. We can see the ing is on the end of hunting, and clearly is hunting is the verb in this sentence. Fred is the subject, four rabbits this morning, prepositional phrase because of four. Well, in this case, hunting is used as a verb. Is is the helping verb. But look over here. Hunting demands a lot of patience. Now we're using hunting as a noun, and its function in the sentence is a subject. This is the verb. Patience is the direct object. Excuse me, it's the object of the preposition here. I almost got confused myself. Of is a preposition, so of patience is a prepositional phrase. A lot is the direct object. Fred likes hunting in deer season. In this case, Fred is the subject, likes is the verb, and hunting becomes the direct object in deer season, as we can see, prepositional phrase. Usually when we talk about verbs, we talk about them in their infinitive form. That means to go, to eat, to walk, to see, and so on. That's called the infinitive. And here, for example, we see to go, to see, to write, to sing, to drive. We can sometimes use the infinitive form as nouns. And remember, a noun can be a subject, direct object, or object of the preposition in a sentence. Let's look at the first sentence here. To cook is Mary's favorite hobby. What's the subject of the sentence? You would think it might be Mary, but it's not. The subject is to cook. Mary is the subject equivalent of to cook. Is is the verb. I'm sorry, excuse me. Hobby is the subject equivalent. 
Marys and favorite are adjectives describing hobby. You caught me on that one. Let's look at this sentence. Mary likes to cook. What's the subject? Mary. Verb. Likes. To cook becomes the direct object. So even though it's an infinitive form of the verb, it can be used as a direct object. Let's look at this example. To hunt is Fred's favorite activity. What's the subject? It's not Fred. It's to hunt. Activity is the subject equivalent of to hunt, and Fred's and favorite are both adjectives describing activity. The verb is is. One more sentence. Fred prefers to hunt in September. Fred is the subject, prefers is the verb. To hunt becomes the direct object. In September, prepositional phrase. Let's take a look at one more example for those of you who enjoy, would like to ski. <clears throat> to ski is an exciting sport. What's the subject? To ski. Sport is a subject equ equivalent of to ski. Is is a verb. Exciting is an adjective describing sport. But look at this. In winter, many people like to ski. What's the subject here? People. In winter is a direct is a uh, prep is a prep phrase. Many is an adjective describing people. Like is the verb of a sentence, and to ski becomes the direct object of the sentence. So again, the infinitive form of verbs, to ski to eat, to hunt, and so on, can be used as subjects or direct objects. Let's change gears a little bit and look at something else about verbs. Whenever you have a sentence, there must be a subject and a verb. That's one of the definitions of a sentence. However, the subject and the verb must agree with each other. Let me show you what I mean. Mary is or are going to school. Which of these is correct? Mary is going to school or Mary are going to school? Clearly is is the correct form, but why? Just because it sounds right? That's not the way to look at it. We have to look at the subject. Subject is Mary. Is Mary a singular thing or a plural thing? Well, there's only one person here, right? One Mary. So Mary is singular which means the verb must also be singular. Are is not singular, it's a plural verb. Therefore, is is correct. Let's look at this one. Mary and Bob is or are going to school. Which one is correct? Well, it's pretty obvious. We have a double subject here, right? Mary and Bob are both subjects. And is a conjunction. We haven't seen many conjunctions lately. But the correct form of the verb is are because we have a plural uh, subject, we have to have a plural verb. That's what the agreement is that we are talking about here. Let's look at another example. Fred was or were playing in the park. What's the rule? If a subject is singular, the verb has to be singular. If the subject is plural, the verb has to be plural. Here we have just one Fred, so we have the singular verb it was is correct. Bob and I was or were playing in the park. Again, we have a double subject, so we have more than one. Were is the plural form of the verb. Let's continue our talk about subject-verb agreement with another example. The nail was or were lying on the bench. Well, we have one nail. Was is correct. The nails was or were lying on the bench. We have many nails. Were is the correct form of the verb. He goes or go to the beach every year. Singular he. The verb must be singular. Goes is the singular form. 
they goes or go to the beach every year. Obviously, they is plural. We have to use the plural form of the verb, which is go. They go to the beach every year. Mary take or takes a lunch to work. Singular Mary takes is correct. They take or takes lunches to work. They is plural. Take must be the correct verb. Okay, now let's look at how you can get into trouble with this. The soccer players are or is going to the big game. Well, what's the subject of the sentence? That's what you always have to ask. What is the subject of the sentence? It is not soccer. Players is the subject. Soccer is an adjective describing players. Now, is players singular or plural? It's plural. So, are is the correct form of the verb. Let's look at this sentence. The team of soccer players is or are going to the big game. Again, what's the first thing we need to do? Ask what the subject is. Well, the subject can be team, it could be players, could be game. Which of those words is the correct subject? Well, it cannot be players because players is part of a prepositional phrase. And this is a rule that's very well uh, remembered. Any word inside a prepositional phrase cannot be the subject. I'm going to repeat that. Any word inside a prepositional phrase can never be a subject. So players is not the subject of the sentence. Team is the subject. Now, is team, is it one team or many teams? It's one team. So in this case, team is singular. It must take a singular verb. Which of these verbs is singular? Is. So the correct sentence says, the team of soccer players is going to the big game. Let's look at this example. The students in the class are taking a test. What's our first question? Where is the subject? Can the subject be class? No. Why? Because it's inside a prepositional phrase. Students is the subject. Is student singular or plural? It's plural. So the verb must also be plural. Are is correct. The students in the class are taking a test. How about this one? The class of students is or are taking a test. Can students be the subject? No. Prep phrase. Class is the subject. Is class singular or plural? It's singular. So the verb must be is. The class of students is taking a test. Let's look at another example. A company of soldiers was or were being trained. Why cannot soldiers be the subject? It's in a prep phrase. Subject is company. Is company singular or plural? Singular. One company. Was is the correct answer. The soldiers in the company was or were being trained. Can company be the subject of this sentence? No. In a prep phrase. The subject is soldiers. Soldiers is plural. The verb must be plural. Were. Last example here. The elders in the council make or makes policy for the church. Okay, can council be the subject? Nope, prep phrase. Elders is the subject. Were, uh, where are we? Yeah, uh, makes. Elders, excuse me, make would be the plural form of the verb. The council of the elders makes or make policy for the church. Elders cannot be the subject in this case. The subject is council. Is this one or many councils? Only one. The correct answer is makes. Now, what is it that causes us to make mistakes like this when we look at sentences like this? It's because sometimes the nouns are collective. They're it's like a group of things. 
And even though it looks like it's many, it's actually one thing. Let's look at some examples here. Group, team, class, club, crowd, audience, committee. Even though they're made up of many members, each word itself is actually singular. A group of something, a team of something, a class of something, a club of something. So these are all singular uh, nouns and therefore as subjects they are singular. And those are called collective nouns. Let's look at our last topic and we'll try uh, this sentence here. Mary was out playing golf one day and she hit her ball uh, down the fairway and then so Mary found her golf ball behind the tree. Very typical sometimes. Now let's compare it with another sentence which is similar, has a similar meaning, but is different in one way. Mary's golf ball was found behind the tree. Now you can see the meaning is almost the same. What is the difference? Why have a second sentence at all? Why isn't the first one good enough? Well, in the first one, what is the subject? Subject is Mary. Found is the verb. Ball is the direct object. Behind the tree, you see, as a prep phrase. The attention is on Mary. Mary is the subject. But in the second sentence, the attention is not on Mary. Now the subject is what? Ball. Ball is doing the action. Sort of. There is not very much action here. But ball is giving, getting our attention or focus. And the ball was found. There's the verb behind the tree prep phrase. Marys and golf become adjectives describing ball. This pattern of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more we're going to take a look at here, uh, which is quite a bit different. We're going to get away from Mary for a second here. Shakespeare wrote the play Macbeth. Oh, there's no doubt about this. What a surprise. Obviously, Shakespeare is the uh, is the um, subject of the sentence, wrote as the verb, and the play, Macbeth, together as the direct object. But we also could say this, the play, Macbeth, was written by Shakespeare, also very common. Again, in the first sentence, the attention, our focus is on the writer, Shakespeare. In the second sentence, our attention is immediately drawn to uh, the play itself. So, what is this construction called when we change the subject to having it sort of in a passive way? Well, it's actually called the passive voice. The first of these sentences up here we call the active voice. The, um, the subject is doing the action. But the second sentence in each one we have put into the passive voice. We have had what used to be the subject now become passive in the sentence, and what used to be the direct object becomes the subject. This is very common uh, in the English language, and I'm sure in other languages also. Um, and but when you're writing, you shouldn't overdo this. Uh, writing, usually writing is more interesting when you stay in the active voice, although the passive voice can be used sometimes. Let's look at this sentence. The letter carrier delivers the mail at 9 a.m. Perfectly good sentence. All right. What is the subject? Letter carrier. Our attention and focus is drawn to the letter carrier, not mail. Mail is the direct object. But if we change the sentence a little bit, we have the mail is delivered at 9 a.m. Same idea. But in this case, the attention is on mail and when it's delivered. It's not really important that the letter carrier has brought it or that the letter carrier uh, even is a person that we know by name. The important thing here is the male itself. Male becomes the subject. The passive voice also allows people to um, become, well, how can I say it, to uh, say a sentence in such a way as to not accept responsibility. Let me show you what I mean here. 
Senator Smith voted, whoops, I'm sorry about that. Senator Smith voted against the bill in committee. Now, if this is a bill that you liked and you find that Senator Smith voted against it, you're not going to think very highly of Senator Smith, are you? So politicians have learned to use the passive voice quite a bit. And if Senator Smith didn't, doesn't want you to know that he voted against the bill, he's likely to report it this way to the newspapers. The bill was voted down in committee. This is a passive construction. Here, the attention is on Bill. Bill, oh, sorry about that. Bill is the subject, whereas before, Senator Smith was the subject. So the second sentence allows Senator Smith to be absented from the responsibility. It's just somebody somehow uh, caused the vote to go down in committee. So the passive voice has a purpose for use. It should not be overused, but it is available uh, if you need to use it. Notice how it's constructed is the verb. In this case, we have a present tense verb, delivers. But if it's a past tense verb, voted, then the passive voice becomes was voted. All right. So, we're going to move on to uh, Module 4 very soon here. Thank you for being with us.